This episode of Pathfinders is sponsored by Be Spatial Ontario. Join them at bespatialontario.ca and earn GISP credits, access webinars, and read the latest GIS industry news. Around the world, in every industry, there are people who excel. People who work hard to push their industry forward, to launch innovative products, build collaborative teams, and bring people together. We call these people Pathfinders, and they help chart a path and inspire your journey. Our goal is to find these Pathfinders and bring their story to you. Well, Ryan Garnett, welcome to Pathfinders. Mm, thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. We were just we were thinking it's been about six years since we saw each other. That's right. Yeah, well, since I left Ontario. Well, it, we, all things come. It's a small community we have, so we all stay connected online, and it's nice That's to right. see you. Yeah. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, so the first question I always pepper my guest with is to say. Uh, help us understand and uh, articulate what GIS is and what the value of it is. So you go to a party, Ryan, and you run up to some, uh, up to some or meet someone, and they say, "Ryan, what do you do for work?" And and you know, what's your answer if, if they're describing how, wanting to, a description of GIS in there? Sure. Yeah. So I would say a little bit different. I wouldn't start with GIS. I would say I help people make informed decisions. Well. Yeah. And something always happens somewhere. Right. That's kind of how it is. And I think we in the GIS, spatial, geo, whatever kind of term you want to use, industry, sell ourselves short and we try to put ourselves into like a box. And I'm trying to like push that a little bit wider. Everything happens somewhere, whether that's mm -hmm. on the server, in your human body, in the universe, there's a component of time and space. Mm -hmm. We as human beings, make some of the most important decisions based on proximity and where. And we like to think logically, or we like to think that we think logically. And so helping people make those decisions a little bit more objectively and, and bringing in the component of where geography. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Cool. So what industry are you applying geography, GIS to? Right now, uh, I'm at the Halifax International Airport, so in the travel business, so not travel, I guess, industry of transportation. So for us, it's transportation logistics as a, an airport, but it's also very customer focused, right? So passenger experience, helping people with their business travel, helping them with their personal travel, things like that. So travel industry, I guess you would say that, transportation industry. Okay. Well, then everything, yeah, everything ties to location there, right? You gotta make yeah. sure that the planes <laughs> land in the right spot and the people get to the right locations. And I would imagine it's- yeah, How they oh. travel around the airport, you name it, down to like the smallest of details. So an airport must be like a small city, really. It very much is, yeah. So like my first day there, it was so funny. Uh, within probably a couple hours, I'm like, this is just a small city. And like coming from municipal government, yeah. So Beforehand, you're like, wow, they have a fire department. They have like snow clearing, like all the things that you think of within uh, any size municipality or city. You're like, we have to do it, and we, and we do it on campus. So, right. So very much right. like a city. Oh, that's cool. So then, so I, I've known you for a while, and if, if anyone ever ever speak or hear Ryan speak, you're a very good speaker and very articulate yeah. and engaging, and uh, and you can tell you have a lot of passion behind what you do. Not a single ounce. Yeah. <laughs> Where does that passion come from? Uh, explain that more to us. I wish I knew, like I would do, because I would bottle it as an elixir and sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it comes from curiosity. Like I'm just genuinely curious. Um, I love to solve problems. I just really do. I don't do crosswords. I'm terrible at Sudoku, like all that kind of like I'm awful at it. But I like to help people solve problems. And I think the passion, if I'm being honest to myself, and I've never said it out loud before, I think it's coming from, I want to prove people wrong because I've been like thought of like, oh, that's not the right thing, right? Like I started at being one to be Yogi the Bear, like recreation and how could you get to those points? I'm like, well, let me show you, hold my, hold my beer kind of. <laughs> like, so the passion's there to challenge myself because my path has been so different from, your stereotypical cookie cutter kind of approach, right? So yeah. 
So I think that passion comes from proving to myself and then proving to others. Okay. And I just love it. Yeah. It's, and I just love it. It gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. You know, I uh, I can uh, I can relate to the wanting to prove something wrong, so, prove someone wrong. So, yeah. I made my first map. I've said this before when I was seven years old, and it actually came out of a healthy level of competition with my father. Really? So, so he used to he worked for the city of Toronto, and so did you. So did you? Yeah, that's right. And he was on the night shift. Uh, he was in the uh, public works department, and he would come home around four o'clock. Or, or sorry, he would leave around four o'clock and I would come home around four o'clock and I would stash my fishing rod at the uh, end of the street Amazing. and I'd come home and I'd fish in the creek there. Yeah. So every day he'd go by, I'd tell him how many fish I caught and, and I'd be, dad, I caught 50 fish today. And he'd say, no, you got the same yeah. fish 50 times, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I got to prove him wrong. So I, I drew a map of the river and then every time I caught a fish, I plotted a, a spot on the map, right? It's amazing. And then the next day he'd come back and say, no, it's just, you know, you caught the same fish in different spots, you know. So it was, it was a healthy desire to prove him wrong that that awesome. drew me to drew me to mapping. I and it's I'm so it's so healthy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> like to push him. In. I think my early memories of maps are gas stations, the old oh. maps, right? Like if you're on a summer trip or you're going somewhere. Yeah. And you're like crossing out, you go to go to the bathroom, but I would always stand and like, where are all the pins from? Where are people traveling? Like it just got me interested in all that. And then I just start who can't believe it's been said so loud. I would read atlases. Nice. <laughs> I'd get nice. lost in an atlas for hours of just oh. like stuff. That's so cool. that geography thing just stayed with me. I just love mm -hmm. it. And I hear some common themes when I meet people that they have are drawn to the visual of maps and the and the curiosity behind you know what's yeah. happening there. Yeah. So yeah. So what is so what's your education then? Like, how did you go from being a young kid looking at gas station maps uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to where you were at the airport? Yeah. Yeah. So if I go all the way back, like through high school and things like that, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I took the academic approach. Like I was like go to university but it was a history major. Like that was the idea. Oh, so okay. I wanted to be Yogi the bear. I wanted to be a park warden, a park ranger. I was like, so excited to do it. I, I took geography, or sorry, biology, honors biology in grade 10. Uh, I think I got a 58 <laughs> I took <laughs> in, in, in grade 11, got like a low 50. So things were really tough and I went into grade 12 and I was going to do it and that's when you meet your guidance counselor, right? Like oh, okay. a coach at that time and you're like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't want to work for parks. Or like, you'll never do it. You can only do that through biology and you suck. <laughs> they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't say that I did. They're yeah. like, well, so you're going to have to like do biology and chemistry and like a natural science. And I'm like, well, that's never going to happen. But my other classes that I was doing was history and geography. Like I was doing those kinds of stuff at the same time. So my thought pattern was let's um, let's give up on parks. And something piqued my interest from my geography teacher. Hmm. His daughter was in Japan. I'm going to get to your question for sure, Jeff. No, it's okay. Know. Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, his daughter was in Japan teaching English. And I was like, why no travel? I can get aid to travel and mm. talk to people and do all this kinds of stuff that that sounds great that's what i'm gonna do that's gonna be right. yeah. so i went to st mary's university and he started in in history and that was gonna be it i was really good at it i could remember things and i was like this is gonna be a breeze and i'll mm. i'll get out and i'll leave and i'll go travel but i met someone in residence and they're like you never heard of lakehead university they have an outdoor recreation and parks and tourism degree and you do you could do a multiple degree I'm like what how come i didn't hear about that as a parks person yeah so then i decided to goof around a lot my first year and um i transferred into geography and then two years later i i, I went to lakehead university and nice. i started I did a parks degree so you do an honors degree in into rec and parks and then i also did a second degree in geography like that's it i got the letters i got the pieces of paper yeah parks canada and in the summers, I was working for Parks Canada. They had a program called Young Canada Works. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you're hired as a supervisor to bring in high school students, and you all live together, and you set them up with jobs. They work in the park. You travel. Like You do all these things. Who's got it better? I have Parks Canada on my resume. I got two degrees. Yeah. 
I had an interview with uh, a local parks program here, didn't get it. And I was like, okay, whatever. And then a warden job came up, I'm like, this is it, here I go. I knew the wardens who were doing all the interviewing and stuff. Okay. I was one of 700 people who applied for one position. In oh camp. my gosh, that's a... Uh... Yeah, right? And then they can't have- can imagine going through those resumes. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy, right? And they have people who have their masters who did wolf tracking and PhD in this, and people who were in public health and safety and their search mm -hmm. and, and no one leaves Parks Canada. So yeah. it was a pretty big eye opener at that point. I was like, okay, this is going to be really hard to go like to do. It's going to be a challenge. So maybe yeah. I need a different tool in my toolbox. Mm. So I went to COGS. So what did, the COGS is the Center for Geographic Science here in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. uh, during my undergraduate degree, I was taking GIS classes because I was just so interested and I thought it was really cool. And when mm -hmm. I took and in Jasper and in Revelstoke, I worked with the GIS person. I was like, this is oh, awesome. that's cool. do some stuff. Yeah. So I worked at COGS uh, for remote sensing. And, uh, okay. uh, and the only reason I went remote sensing over GIS is like, I'm going to look at job applications and see what the difference is. And like remote sensing came up. I'm like, that's a clear distinction. When I look at what you take in courses, we all take the same GIS courses and I just got a chance to have. Yeah. Like, oh, cool. Maybe that's a difference. Right. In the job and market. that is a difference. Yeah. I'm assuming we're in the mid 2000s around here. Like. 2003. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so at that there. time, that was the up and coming thing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I was like, I had failed so much in this parks job thing. Like, I needed an advantage. Like, I just needed yeah. an advantage, but someone else doesn't. So I did remote sensing. And uh, COGS at that time, I don't know if it would anymore, but at that time, it was like a really well renowned school. Yeah. And like, it had a great. Yeah, it still is. Yeah. yeah. And a good hiring thing. And I got a job right out of school. So I got a job out of school. And I started to make flight simulators for a military subcontractor in Ottawa. We were called X-Wave and we'd make flight sims. And I still had the urge to travel. And and I was always constantly trying to learn. I was doing database stuff at night mm -hmm. school and mm -hmm. all these different pieces. And I decided at a young age, like not a young kid age, young professional age, mm -hmm. I wanted to move around. And I wanted someone to pay for my travel. So I moved a lot. So I, uh, every couple of years, I'd go to different places. I lived in Newfoundland. I moved to the United States, and I got a lot of different experience and got like, I did a lot of things. Yeah. The parks was still there. It was still there. So I went yeah. back. To the park, right. So I guess I, you're just like you're like the white whale here. You're just like, <laughs> Captain Ahab. Yeah. Yeah. So like I I'd been working for about six plus years. I lived in India. I was doing all these cool fun stuff. 3D visualization before Google was doing 3D stuff. Oh, it's really oh. fun. Yeah. But I wanted to do parks. I'm like, okay, I'll go back. I'll do my master's in parks related stuff. Okay. I'll bring everything that I learned from 3D viz, and I'm going to throw that into a world of parks and wilderness and all that kind of stuff. That's got to be it. And I did my, my master's project research for Puckasaw National Park, which is in Lake Superior. Oh, yeah. Look in that area. It's like, yeah. this is it. No, <laughs> it's just it's weird. well, that really said, okay, let's go all in on, on, on like data and analytics, and yeah, geography yeah. and GIS and stuff like that. So I, I kept working and and went back to the United States for a little bit and got married. And then at that point, Canadians and TN visas were a little bit more challenging. My wife was a teacher, so they okay. were doing that. Came back to Canada, started a PhD, and then moved to the city of Toronto. And here we go. Yeah, and here you go. And the so rest that, of the history. Kind of things moved. I know that's a long winded story, but like that's kind no, of no. I, I mean, there's some lessons to be learned in there. I love the first of all, I love the tenacity of just keep going for the goal that you had, right? Yeah, and then the fact that you, you realize that you needed an advantage that you're just not going to sit back and go, oh, Well, I guess it's not going to work. You kept driving to find a new advantage and, and do constant learning around it. Yeah, um, and then sometimes you have to realize maybe it's more of a passion project than it is a career project. Yeah. Yeah. However, you got to live in Jasper, right? Is that what I heard mm -hmm. there? Which is one of the most beautiful parks in, in, in all of uh, all, all of Canada. Phenomenal. And Revelstoke. And, and yeah. 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 Like, just so. gorgeous places. And you're still young, so you never know what the future holds. That's right. <laughs> well, anybody in Parks Canada, hey, give me yeah. a call. <laughs> I'm going to send this directly to them. Yeah, totally. <laughs> 
Well then, so so I I met you at City of Toronto is where I was with York Region. They share a boundary. We, you know, heard of this uh, cool all this cool stuff happened in Toronto. Yeah, right. So tell us like the achievements and the actions that you've achieved. You know, since City of Toronto, like what are some of the things you've been proud of that you've? I think what I'm proud of is I took from City of Toronto and applied it elsewhere. So, so when I when I joined City of Toronto, I was in my I was in my PhD at McMaster, and we were doing electric mobility and all that kind of stuff. And I decided to leave there to to go work for government. I was like, "What are you doing?" And I saw the City of Toronto as a university. Yeah. I saw it as academia. I was like, "But I didn't have to apply for research. Like I had a guaranteed funding model. So mm-hmm. like my friends are professors and." And they were getting ready to graduate. They were a couple of years ahead of me. And, you know, you talk to people and you listen. I was like, and I had worked at a university beforehand. So I'm like, okay, it's a grind and it's really hard to get funded. Yeah. You have to do so much grant writing as, as a professional, like as a yeah. college and stuff like that. But here's the biggest city in our country. Mm-hmm. The fourth largest budget in our country, like yeah. government budget. Yeah. I don't have to apply for anything. Like I'm just going to have that availability. And attracting students is really hard for for universities. Mm-hmm. But here I have a guaranteed workforce. Mm-hmm. So I took that as an opportunity to look at it and do everything as research within a government and within an organization. Mm-hmm. And governments back in the '70s, I'm not old enough to know. I was born in the late '70s, but everything I heard and read and watched must do was that's where the cool stuff was happening back in the day Mm -hmm. because they had a budget (laughs) because they had infrastructure so i was like i want to take that research mindset and drop it into a universe into a government and like let's research let's innovate let's do all that kind of stuff Mm. if you used to but let's do it for social good Mm. so i took that mentality and that scrappy attitude and trying to do more with less. Uh, I don't know if that was your model at the York region, but it definitely was at the city of Toronto trying to do more with less. Yeah. And, stuff. Well, and then I brought it forward, never forgetting the idea to be open source, never forgetting that that smaller places don't always have the resource and the budget that the city of Toronto does. Yeah. Like, I mean, being born in Nova Scotia. Oh, that? Know. Okay. Right? Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, so it just clicked as to why. Now I understand why you were all in on open source because you were using working at Toronto as as a research project. You wanted the work that came out of Toronto. I'm putting words in your mouth here, so yeah, tell me if I'm wrong. To be shareable for other cities, is that? Yeah. Okay. Because coming from Nova Scotia, you know Toronto gets everything. Yeah. They always yeah. have, including it. on the news. You know, fair, exactly. And yeah. It's like, but yeah. you know. You may think you're the center of the earth, but geographically speaking, you are not. It's no. Anyways, I wanted to switch that around and then like working there and even like chatting with you and some of the stuff that you've heard. And like when you invited me to go with some of the York region, different stuff and listening to people, mm-hmm. their challenge was like, we don't have the resource capability. We can't yeah. attract that kind of stuff. It's really hard for us to get it. And, and when I was in the open data, like, we would love to do it, but we can't. We don't have the money. We don't yeah. have the resources. There's no way for us to tackle it. I'm like, then I think it's our civic duty as the largest municipal government and the fourth largest financial budget, government budget, to do this for other people so they can. Yeah, and to give and back. The, yeah, because the thing yeah. that people are, we're all sharing the same problems. So why would we try to slice and dice it yeah. and do it a different way? Like if we could all come together and mm-hmm. we just build something that someone could use, then we're going to solve these problems exponentially faster. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I'm, uh, now I understand you even more now. So when I, I did something similar. So when I went to government, it was around the same time that I had a family and I thought, oh, I need to get some stability. And I, I'm yeah. feeling maybe with yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to go and my parents were longtime government workers. It was wonderful, right? Same. Yeah. I didn't want to feel trapped that I was there forever. So I never lost my account manager mindset. In my mind, I was a private sector mindset working yeah. inside government. Same. And I think for you, you, you kept your academia mindset yeah. inside government. I think that's how we came together, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And I have a little bit of like 
entrepreneurial startup like working in tech like yeah. working in the united states i'm like we can do things small and cool it doesn't have yeah. to be a ginormous project you can do by yeah. just so what were some of the some of the things you did uh, i can think of one yeah like what were some of the things that you the accomplishments and i can think of one around lidar but well i was going to go there yeah I was gonna <laughs> that. um i don't really think it's that much of an accomplishment it's just i think it's just looking at the problem differently yeah. so if you want to say it's accomplishment i will take it but like at that time we were people were trying to do stuff still um photogrammetry and for people who may not know what photogrammetry is, is like three, flying an airplane 3d images people have to trace stuff out in 3d um beautiful mm -hmm. it makes gorgeous stuff it's mm -hmm. extremely expensive it's extremely slow uh, it's absolutely tediously manual mm -hmm. and no place teaches it anymore so it's a dying art mm -hmm. it's dying art and it's unfortunate because a big part of my career has been photogrammetry related mm -hmm. in the united states we were the biggest aerial photography company in north america and photogrammetry was a big part of that so i have a mm -hmm. I have a passion and a, a love for it from from history but from a person running a business like within government like this can't happen <laughs> like, yeah. like we can't do this yeah and the questions and the asks and the things that people want it climate change smart city infrastructure has to go faster yeah so i know of lidar because our company also did it and i had worked with it and i had done it in college and then i know the value of it so let's bring it in but i don't want to be responsible for all the craziness of it so mm -hmm. we found that it had already been flown they had already been flown in our area and go figure they want to fly toronto again the benefit of being the largest city you kind of get to do some things mm -hmm. People went you around. So I reached out to the company who had done it and I found out that they had a different license agreement. Like, oh, you're government, you're gonna do this stuff. I'm like, cool, yep, uh, we'll pay for that. And it costs us 1 20th of, a, of an acquisition or less. I can't remember, Jeff. It was like, you know, I remember it being like, credit credit like director level credit card approved kind exactly. of, yeah, yeah. yeah like rather than hundreds of thousands of yeah. followers it's in yeah. the single to tens or like, yeah yeah it was right like yeah. like this conversation Shockingly is more expensive than just buying it kind of yeah, yeah. kind of thing yeah. so i was like let's do it let's bring it in no one knew how to work with it i'm like that's fine we'll bring it in we'll have it and we can do it and what it allowed us to do was to do the stuff that to give people information and products and data that they could never get before. And some of the things that were of interest was every single building could now have a height down within the 10 centimeter range. Mm. Um, yeah. Where is, how does water actually run? So for those of you who live in the GTA, do you know the flooding problem in the DVP? For those of you who mm. don't live in the GTA, there is a flooding problem in the DVP. So that's yeah. the Don Valley Parkway. It's a big major road, like highway. And when it rains, the sewers back up and it floods. So we can now show how water moves every 10 centimeters in like crazy amount. So mm. like, hey, look, that sewer drain doesn't take it. So you are going to flood. This is how you can simulate it. And you mm -hmm. can do these pieces. We were able to do that. We were able to automatically extract things. So if, you, if you're if you looking for something on scale, you do got to give up a little bit of precision, like if you want it fast. and, and mm -hmm. So that was a really nice talking point. So instead of like theoretically and people not being able to see what that means, like, hey, here, mm -hmm. this is what we can do really quick. Does that mean your needs are like, oh, beyond our needs? Like, mm -hmm. great. So now we can focus the high precision um, stereo compilation in places that needed it rather than trying to use one brush to paint an entire room. Yeah, yeah. What what I really liked about what you did at the time and what you're explaining now is you you went to the business units and said, what problems are you trying to solve? Yeah. You know, problems of planning, of, of, of uh, risk mitigation, asset mm -hmm. management, yeah. uh, solar potential for energy. You you know? got it. Yeah. It's like and like we want to use data to do it but rather than like oh this is a cool tech let's just bring it in it's like well no like even though it's cheap if, if there was going to be no use i don't want to bring it down no yeah yeah so so what we did is we did that and we talked to amazing people like yourselves and like we did like a 
think it was an Ontario-wide survey. Didn't we do an Ontario-wide survey to see of interest? Yeah, we had a whole session of over, I want to say like over 100 municipalities that came yeah, into York so. Region and you yeah. gave a, a keynote on it and yeah. And then from there, people came together and purchased together to, to drop the price. And then, then we had better sharing of information and stuff like that. So I was really proud to like yeah. show how things that seem hard are very possible when you look at it in a different way. And, you know, as a government, we have a bigger collective when we purchase together. Absolutely. Yep. And that's your civic duty, as you said, to it do is. more with less. Yeah. yeah. And that's so, one thing. Yeah. So cool. tell us then, it's not all easy, right? And I remember those days, procurement's tough to navigate, people are tough to Tell us about the tenacity you've had to apply throughout your career to overcome some of the challenges. Yeah, so I think uh, the term I use is creativity. I don't, I don't see things in black and white, I see things in gray, and I don't mean that from a color blind. Like, yeah. like if you say that, I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't say this. <laughs> and I firmly believe in asking for forgiveness than permission. And I think delivery trumps everything. Mm -hmm. so if you yeah. can deliver and you can share that. And I, I generally try to not take any credit for anything. Like I just don't, that's not, that's not it because mm -hmm. giving away that credit gives me more. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you think of it as like an, a dollar in a dollar out yeah. to give more credit means that I'm actually going to get more, be able to do more. So I give that credit away. Yeah. So, so taking those mindsets has allowed me to like look at it differently. And and if we stick with procurement as an example, so for all you municipal government people out there that have this, here's the key to moving fast. Use your tools. So yeah. we had a thing in the city of Toronto called a low value quote, hmm. and it allowed allowed me at the level that I had my signing authority to sign off on. I think it was fifty thousand uh dollars. -huh like 50 grand or 25 or it was like some number i can't remember anymore mm -hmm. and for those of you in municipal government procurement please close your ears because <laughs> this is the only way that we could do it the wording in there is that you you send out a quote to three organizations and you get it to come back i think they forgot when it was written mm. and the purpose of it was to go after like hard goods like you know, yeah. shoes or hammer or yes something. Yeah. I'm going to send it to some places. Maybe I send it to places that can. Maybe I send it to places that cannot get that information. But I would leverage it into small projects. So rather than thinking of things as mm -hmm. like this massive, ginormous piece, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have the vision and the forethought. And this yeah. is where the product piece came from. For so yeah. we'll open to little chunks. I'll do yes. this. We'll reiterate on the new one. We'll do yeah. a new one, and then we can go after it. And I didn't let them say no to me. No. I was like, okay, cool. Help me educate on how I can get to yes. Yeah, yeah. I always think that it's never a no. It's just a not now. Yeah. So I'll come back later. But I just want to be clear. You're not con. You weren't contract splitting in any ways. You were building out pieces of a foundation. Just Tiny little parts. Because you saw a bigger vision. You're like, okay, I'm going to invest this money in that piece. Then yep. I'm ready on going this piece. And that's. Yeah. And the other thing I was doing is I was I heard things that procurement specifically wanted to do and they didn't know how to do it and and mm. where, where it was and i could do it within my my purview and no one could say no and not in a bad way it's just like mm -hmm. he's, he's objectively allowed to do that they wanted to figure out how they could do micro procurement yeah it's not not designed for agile companies that are small innovative and agile uh i feel bad for them because governments are designed to weed them out That's so it needs it needs leaders like yourselves and others and my friends in york and others to push and be, do the forgiveness and then ask, uh, sorry, forgiveness, forgiveness. Yeah, after for, for, for <laughs> because, well, they're a great success story that has come out of Toronto and you were heavily involved, I believe, in the open data program, right? Yeah. In Toronto. yeah. So it's a company called Ratio City. So Ratio City has built out, look it up, ratio.city uh, yeah. has just been acquired by Esri Canada awesome. and is now created all based on Toronto's open data program. Um, and then now uh, are a major division within Esri Canada. And it's because it's of amazing. you and your colleagues yes. fought to do that, right? Like, and that's what we wanted. Like yeah. we wanted businesses to benefit from it. Why does it have to stay in the vault in the in the silo yeah. of an organization? Yeah. Like yeah. who I can't think of what innovative, amazing things people are gonna do 
So yeah. let's get it out there for more people to, to do. And, and that's what we did. And we yeah. procured little tiny things to help build out that program. And that mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. So that, there you go. Things like that can happen. For and sure. that's a success story. And, you know, I know at the province of Nova Scotia where I'm at now, those are the stories that they want to say that open data can get. Like everyone within yeah. government is like, how is this benefiting society? How is this generating jobs in yeah sex dollars and all that stuff like those are the success stories that they want to do so sometimes you get a rock support. you've got to push i i agree and, and getting things like an open data policy approved through council that, that has open by default tell me why our data should not be open yep and if you can't prove why it's not going to be open we're going to share it and and these are now coming online right and yep, because they are. private sector companies small organizations they can fix some of the problems that municipalities have and the data sits in there so People like yourselves who went in and rattled the cages and and made a difference. Well, yeah, like the two, the two things inside of that that I am proud of, and I'm bringing this into like the airport as well, is like, oh. so we did an open data master plan. So it was like how we were going to do stuff and it was council, it had to get mm -hmm. it. So I mean, there's lots of talk about there. Mm -hmm. I was just like, no, we're doing it. It's not even up for debate. We're doing this. And everyone mm -hmm. on the team get on board because this is what we're doing. Hmm. Baking in that we have to use open source. Yeah. yeah. Right? You have to do it. We inferably heard that. People said they wanted us to be open. They wanted to be able to collaborate with us. Yeah. Do those things. But you can't collaborate behind a license. Yeah. Yeah. When I hear open source, I hear interoperable. I hear people work, being able to work together. I don't hear any one entity being able to hoard. And that's what it's, is good. Like, yeah. We need that. Yeah. Yeah. So we bait that in. That was risky. And at that yeah. moment in time, government was like, oh, open source is made by like hackers in their mom's basement. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Internet. That's an old mindset. On yeah. it for like 50 years. Like all yeah. your software is that. So like it, it took some some gusto to educate and now they're really leveraging it. Yeah. And just before I left, this was one thing that I was really pumped with. So we had a really active counselor, Paul Ansley, like, and I think he's still really active in the open data community in Toronto. And, mm -hmm. and he was, his his uh, office had reached out and was like, how do we push it forward? How do we even do even more that we're doing? Because we're not seeing the traction that we would hope to have people releasing data. And that mm -hmm. would be within, within yeah. an organization. I'm like, if you want to be wild, Paul, Here's what we do. And we wrote it up as a council motion and then got approved. And I don't know if people are leveraging it because I haven't been paying attention. Mm. So for all of you out there, if you want to do something, here's how you do it. What we said is anything that was publicly available uh. on the city's website that directly or indirectly touched data had to be made public. Mm. Any report, any map, any application, yeah. any data that touched it had to be open in the open data program, period. So anytime someone wants to put something out, it meant that they were also releasing the data to go behind it. Mm -hmm. so it just gave us more traction, right? Like how many yeah. times do you hear of like uh, the snow plow app or the garbage app or the, the planning yeah. zone bylaws? Like, hey, like we want that for other reasons and who knows what they're going to build. Yeah. People are like, no, it's like, okay, cool. Get ready. I'm just going to scrape your website and crash it on. Yeah. Yeah. Might as well be more proactive. Yeah. Well, my colleagues in York Region did a, took another step. Is they um, they put out an information management policy policy that staff had to sign to say that this is this is the corporation's data, it's the taxpayers' data. Yeah. Just because you're the director of wherever or the it doesn't mean you own it. It's exactly. it, and then in the code of conduct, put in that you're a data, you're a steward of data and must be open and sharing, is at least internally, right? Exactly. So it was you know the bust those older ways of thinking they had to go almost a little bit punitive and say this is a code of conduct violation and, and i think that's you know sometimes you have to, to yeah. do that to shame or hold people yeah. to the fire yeah. you know, do a little bit of change and then they self-reflect and are like no that was the right thing yeah it always is it always went to be yeah. out yeah. Well then, how has so all, bringing this full circle? So you've yeah. gone along. Well, you've got. A, I didn't realize your journey has been so diverse. Yeah. How has uh, how's your career humbled you so far? Um, I think it's humbled me in the sense of there's so much more mm. that can be done. Change management is the most important. Literacy. It's it's as, as people who want to who want. Sorry. 
for change agents, right? Like the people who want to do that, it's your responsibility to educate. Yeah. The badge that comes with it. Um, it's humbled me to think that as much as I have a ginormous amount of imposter syndrome, hmm. um, there are people who who aren't at that level, and I need to help bring them up. It's hmm. my responsibility to help bring them up and not assume that people know what they know, mm -hmm. or what I think they should know. Mm -hmm. I, know what I don't know, but I think they should. I think that's really been humbling. Um, hmm. And then I so don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, everything I, you don't know, you know. know anything. Like it's so well, big there. I'm curious. So you recently did a, I, I saw on LinkedIn that you did a keynote speech. Yeah. And I'm curious about imposter syndrome because that comes up a lot in people who are very uh, successful, people who are, are out there trying to push the limits. Yeah. Um, I suffer from that myself uh you know you, you you when you're you're like who am i to you know do this stuff anything you can share on that like how do you get through it um <laughs> i laugh a lot <laughs> <laughs> good i i uh, i mean this in the in the nicest of ways i don't really care what anyone thinks anymore hmm. like, like yeah. i just don't yeah um i try to be honest with myself as much as i tell people to be honest to themselves mm -hmm. And when I self-reflect, I'm like, I have done some weird stuff. And I mean that in a nice way. I've, I've had those opportunities. Yeah. And um, maybe someone wants to hear about it. Yeah. yeah. I don't go in thinking that I know everything. It's like maybe they're interested in hearing something. And it sparks an interest in their mind. And they take it a different way. Yeah. It doesn't mean what I'm saying is right. It's just maybe, you know, maybe it helps. And, and yeah. I go back to my early, early days. Um, I don't know if it was in school or if it was in like a work session or something like that. It's like you're not allowed to say no in a brainstorming event because oh, yeah. you never know how what that stems into. So I take that. Oh, yeah. I was like, doesn't mean I'm right, but maybe it triggers something for someone else to go somewhere and to do it. Yeah, so, yeah. It's like that stand-up comedian that that yes and is it that whole thing of just say yes yeah. and and keep going, see what happens. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Cool. So that, that's really been helpful for me. And then I think the more that I have done it, because, you know, like I did a fair bit before, and I'm trying to get back into that now. When you hear people only one, right? You hear that in teachers, it takes one student to make it all worthwhile. You hear from one person, yeah. well, that helped me. Like, thanks a lot for yeah. being out there and speaking the truth or saying what you did. So yeah. that helps me get past some of the imposter syndrome yeah. that I carry a ton. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dan Reed, we work together oh, yeah. uh, sometimes, and I, I confided in him often. I was like, Dan, I'm not good enough. I don't like it. Like, I hmm. have that background. I have crazy imposter syndrome. And what he said to me many times, and, and I'm trying to take it to heart, which I do, it's like, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know hmm. that's what's creating your imposter syndrome. It's because you're so you're so aware of the things that you don't know because of your experience. That that's really driving your imposter syndrome. Yeah, interesting. Like that's you're look right. At it. <laughs> right? I'm going to school. You're like, I can do anything because yeah. you don't know anything. Yeah, you yeah. Know. <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, as we get older, we realize all the things we don't know. <laughs> yeah. So like, younger, okay, yeah. I can do that, Dan. Yeah, I can that's, do that. well, that's good. 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 Uh, advice from dan there yeah. well i can tell you honestly you you really made a difference for us in york region when you yeah. were were able and willing to come up to us and and share your thoughts and it sparked a lot of those aha moments and so you oh, certainly thanks. left a legacy oh, in, my, in, in my time working with you there i just yeah, want to let you know that, that. yeah thanks so much thank you and like i just want to keep doing it like <laughs> it doesn't well, then, take much for for to start a spark of fire in somebody yeah well then, what what's your final thought? What would you say to those folks who watch my show? They're in the early to mid career in GIS, sometimes wondering where what they should do, where they should go. What would what's your final thought to those folks? Be weird. <laughs> be weird. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, be, be weird, weird and set aside time to not work during work. I think that's been some of the biggest things in my my recent career is to prioritize time to think. Uh. So we started it late 
in in the city of Toronto, and then I really ramped it up in a couple of different places, and it's been super successful at the airport. Mm. I'm going to write about it actually, and it was like giving people free time to just think, and the expectation is you will not produce anything, so don't feel like you're going to produce anything. And people are like, "What the heck are you doing?" I'm like, "Listen, people are at work. It's a Friday afternoon. No one wants to work. They're ramped down the moment they walked in. So I only yeah. do it on Friday afternoons because right. I know." They're unproductive anyway. So if I can get one up to zero, it's a hundred percent improvement. They're at work. Some people may check Facebook, they may go from whatever. Cool. But most of the time, people want a chance to think about something within their role. Mm -hmm. they, they just do, but they can't justify or somebody doesn't justify the time for them to think. Yeah. Early yeah. on, I just made it a, like a free opportunity and no one took advantage of it. So it's like, okay, like that didn't that didn't work. So I, I restructured it, and in a couple of different places, um, I did it a few different ways. And what seems to work best? So do this as your uh, for those of you who are first into a leadership role, those of you who want to carve out some stuff, put it in your calendar. Hmm. Nothing is allowed to take it over. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So like, Yo, no, I don't go. To, like that is my time. Yeah. And, and I put it in our staff's time, like my teammates' time. It's like, you're doing this and, and we're coming together. So I just came out of it now with Will and I. So shout out to Will Hibson. And we don't know what we're going to talk about sometimes. Mm -hmm. We just go in and every single time it has a benefit to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And, and we came out of it like, so as a success story, you don't know what you're going to get because your mind isn't bound yet. Mm -hmm. So we're able to ebb and flow. Sometimes we watch videos to get inspiration. Sometimes today we talked about challenges. So it was mm -hmm. like, how do, we, how do we teach people? How do we increase the literacy within these stuff? But mm -hmm. this year we developed a, an open source package, like an R, we write in R, an R package to fill the need that doesn't exist in the industry. Mm -hmm. You can't do automated data pipelines in an R environment. Like you just oh, can't do that. Yeah. It's all Python driven. So we open sourced it. And it's benefited our organization in the savings of tens of thousands of dollars a month in cloud fees because yeah. we don't just oh, wow. areas we can run it somewhere else. So like yeah. you just never know what you're going to get. So I would say to those early careers, mid careers, early into leadership, time to think is the most important, and don't put any burden on yourself that you have to produce because mm. it's going to come. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> I love that idea. And I don't do that. And what happens is I take a vacation and usually about four days into my vacation, there. I go, oh shit, that's a great idea. Because <laughs> my brain is constantly chugging, but it takes three to four days to come down from the immediacy of all the things you got to do, right? I love, and also I can imagine the trust it builds in your team that you're just saying to them, hey, go, go do that. Cool. I trust you, come back and it'll work. Yeah. yeah, and like, okay, yeah, you might go on Instagram, but I don't know what you might see that sparks an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. well, and maybe they just need to chill, like I need, need that time to just relax. Yeah, because yeah. we are more in a knowledge economy these days. We're no longer in factories where we're pumping out uh, nope. widgets. We're in thinking, so That's why would you know? Yeah. What that big idea is going to lead you, right? Yeah. And sometimes the, the best idea is like, Oh, we tried that three weeks ago and it failed. So let's not invest that time. Let's think of it in maybe in a different path. Hmm. Because we've already done that research and like coming from the academic research, like as we kind of started, yeah. there are no journals of failed experiments. So like sometimes you need that so you can go yeah. in and not waste your time doing a lit review and doing experiments to find out that breaks. Yeah. Cool. Well, we've come to the end of our time, right? And uh, <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank yeah. you. I love it. Uh, be weird. <laughs> I love it. Be weird. Be weird. Push the boundaries. You, uh, you know. I wouldn't say you're weird. You're, you're innovative and you're yeah. agile and you're exactly what municipalities, organizations need right now. So oh, thank you. Thanks for being a Pathfinder, Ryan. My pleasure, and uh, hopefully we do lots more of this. Yes. Well, I'm going to check in in five years. See if you're at a park. And, and, and <laughs> someday you'll be running Banff National Park, maybe. Oh, that'd be awesome. I love that. <laughs> All right. Well, have a wonderful day, Ryan. Thank you. you Thanks so much. Okay. Take care. Bye.
This episode of Pathfinders is sponsored by Be Spatial Ontario. Join them at bespatialontario.ca and earn GISP credits, access webinars, and read the latest GIS industry news. Daddy's always going blah, blah, blah.